Okay, mic is on. It's one minute after six, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. My name is Liz McCormick. I'm the Director of Innovation Initiatives here at Grand Rapids Community College, and I want to welcome you all here tonight. It's so great to see you here and excited. Uh, it's going to be a great night. We're going to give away over $5,000 in cash prizes, and we're going to get a great idea that we can implement here at GRCC for a longstanding problem we've had. Um, so we've got two hours together tonight. We'll move through the program uh, pretty quickly. We're going to start with some opening remarks with uh, the college president, Dr. Steve Ender. Thank you, Liz, and good evening. I was running a little late. I couldn't find a place to park on this campus. I, I don't understand that. <laughs> so maybe next year this time I won't have that problem. Um, welcome, everyone. This is our second year through Armino Median sponsorship that we've been able to um, conduct, implement uh, this competition uh, in the area of innovation tied to specific problems that we have here on the campus. Uh, last year's winners, uh, as I recall, were, were submitted and won for a rideshare program uh, that we are piloting now through um, our travel office, in effect, trying to make sure people that are going to the same place outside of the Grand Rapids area are aware that others are going there too and perhaps riding together rather than taking three or four vehicles uh, to those conferences. So tonight's uh, challenge, quite frankly, as the president, I thought was rather daunting, quite frankly, given the time frame of five years and the kind of um, enormity of the problem. We just did a consumer sentiment survey uh, and, and we really are viewed quite, quite favorably by this Kent County community. The number one overriding top of mind problem when you think about GRCC is parking. Number one and far, far away. So we do have some real issues in that area that I'm hopeful some of the ideas that come out of tonight's presentations will begin to to help us see uh, another way to, to solve those concerns. And nothing would please me more if I was the guy on the other end of the button that got to implode one of our parking ramps. I think that would be very cool for all kinds of reasons. Uh, so we'll see where your ideas take us. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Liz and we'll move on with the program. Liz? Thank you, Steve. Um, well, as Steve mentioned, this is our uh, second year doing the Innovation Awards here at GRCC. And none of this work would be possible uh, without um, a, a wonderful former alumnus of GRCC, a local philanthropist, somebody who's been a great fan of our college um, and a great fan of innovation. And without him sort of stepping up and saying, I want to support GRCC's value on this, support our faculty, students, and staff having an opportunity to solve and get involved in, in solving some of our largest problems, we wouldn't be here tonight. So I want to welcome um, Armin Omedian, and he's going to say a few words. Good evening. It's so nice to uh, be here talking about innovation. Innovation is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I say thing because it's so difficult to define what it is. I've been reading a book and it says innovation is this and this, and pretty soon he's talking about invention. And invention and innovation are not the same thing. But he wrote the book and he's getting a lot of money for it. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. Innovation is taking an idea, th these are my, my definitions. It's taking an idea, getting an idea, and doing something with it and make it happen. Take it all the way. It isn't just coming up with an invention. It's doing something with it. Uh, the, the fellow that wrote this book said that you really ought to be talking about entrepreneurs because without entrepreneurs, innovation doesn't mean anything. And entrepreneurs have to take it to the marketplace to get jobs. But without innovation, the entrepreneur uh, will have a little trouble. But we, we have to stretch our mind. 
we have to find ways to do things differently than we've been doing it. Some of the same things, we have to do them differently, smarter, better. And when I talked to Liz a couple of years ago, I said, Liz, how do we get this going? How, how do we have this become something real in the school? And she said, well, I think we have to take it to the faculty. And if we can get the faculty to be involved, it'll work. Well, we took it to the faculty, and this is the result of it. And, and we're just proud, I'm, I'm very proud, with the effort that's being made to take this kind of project in, on and bring it to fruition. Thank you for your effort. Thank you, Armin. Okay, so um, just saying a few words about innovation here at GRCC, um, because I get that question a lot too. Exactly what is innovation? And the college has innovation as a value that helps define our culture and who we are. And we actually put a definition to that because innovation does mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And I'm gonna read it so I get it exactly right. Um, we seek creative solutions to problems through experimentation and adaptation. That means we're willing to try some new things, figure out what works, what doesn't work, learn from our mistakes, and keep iterating and trying again. So that's how we define GRCC um, defines innovation. And there's sort of four tenets to making this work. And they're really important uh, when we thought about how would we design a competition. As Armin said, it's not just about the idea. So we decided that we'd put the competition in two rounds. The first round really was about the idea, trying to get as many people engaged to submit ideas on, on problems. But the idea doesn't take it far enough. Then we need people to try to research those ideas, pilot and test, experiment with those ideas, and bring them forward into implementation so they can really have a lasting impact. If it's a good idea and we implement it right, it will add value, both for the people we serve and for this institution. And that's really what innovation is all about. So in order to get that going, we have to have a few tenets around innovation. And the first one is always to work on a real problem. Not something that seems interesting, but something that's actually important and real. So that was our first criterion. As Dr. Ender said, this is more than a 20-year problem here at the institution in a lot of various forms. So it was a really good problem for us to tackle. The second thing is to find a champion, because nothing does happen without passion and somebody has that idea. But then you need a team. So that's the third criteria. You've got to have a team. And a, a, interdisciplinary team that brings different perspectives and different skill sets is really the best way to do it. That's why we wanted faculty, staff, and students to have an opportunity to seek each other out, bring different perspectives to the idea they were working on. So that's why we're structuring the team competition the way we are. And then the fourth one really is follow a process, right? So there has to be a process. There's stages to this. First, there's discovery about what the good idea would be. Then we got to research it, right? Then you had to do some piloting and testing. Then you have to do some validation before we actually get it implemented. And so that's, that's what happened in this competition. We had 18 ideas submitted in round one. 10 of those were awarded $100. And, and eight of those 10 people are in this room with their teams who decided we have enough merit to our idea that we want to see it move forward and see if we can't prove some feasibility with this. So. Um, those are the tenets around innovation. An event like this, you know, before we actually get started on our student presentations, we got to thank a few people besides Dr. Ender um, and Armin. Um, we need to thank um, the committee who put this together. Again, this isn't my work. This is a GRCC value, and it belongs to the institution. And we've been blessed to have a phenomenal committee these last two years that helped make this possible. And I know some of those folks are sitting here with us tonight. Becky Yoder, if you could stand up, please. Moss Ingram. Class Quant, who's in our, our video booth, who's done all the video work for us. Vicki Hudson's from Communications. Julie Langer, where's Julie? If you could stand a minute. Um, Julie is with Staff Development and helped us, uh, is new this year and jumped on the committee to help. Um, Ann Sandberg, uh, Don Van Overen, and Jeff Danner, who did all the printing of the, the checks that we've been awarding for your $100 prizes and the big prizes. Uh, so we wanna give all those folks a round of applause and thank them very much. Okay, so how this 
uh, is going to work for tonight, right? All of the teams know that you put a little video clip together. Um, and what's going to happen is that we're going to roll the video clip, and then I'm going to call down the team champion, and they are going to come down, and they're going to introduce their team to the judges, and then you're going to have uh, a few minutes to answer Q&A with our judges here tonight. So before we get into that, I'm going to bring up Moss Ingram. He's going to talk about the scoring criteria real quickly and introduce our judges. Good evening. This is very, very exciting. We uh, received, as Liz mentioned, 18 uh, submissions, and in October, uh, we went through the round one uh, criteria. And the criteria for round one was weighted, and we um, put 20% of the, uh, uh, the weighting toward originality. We wanted to make sure that the idea was unique, and that, the, um, uh, that there was some sort of novelty, there was something uh, special about the approach toward solving uh, the issue. The second uh, piece of criteria had to do with alignment, and that also received, uh, no, I was, excuse me, that didn't, uh, the weighting there was a little different. So it was increased to 30%, and that was, um, how directly does this uh, idea impact the topic of parking to make sure that we're actually well aligned with GRCC, our community, and improving uh, the, the congestion that we cause and the, and the parking issues that we cause um, with uh, our, st our students and our, our faculty and staff. And then the third one, uh, which was weighted the heaviest at 50%, was feasibility. And that has everything to do with how likely is this going to actually solve the problem. So that was the criteria that then uh, took the 18 uh, down to now the true eight. And this evening, the criteria is going to be um, collaboration. We want to see that there was, a, there was a team, that there was teamwork, there was involvement, uh, multiple thoughts, diverse thoughts uh, towards solving the issue. Uh, the second is presentation, so 25% waiting for that. Uh, the quality of the pilot project and the materials that were submitted. And then 50% waiting for uh, impact. So the evidence that this will indeed solve the problem. So um, for round one, we had uh, three judges uh, go through that material. Haris Alabashk, who is the director of uh, sustainability initiatives from the city, uh, was one of the judges, uh, along with two of our uh, current judges. Haris, unfortunately, was not able to join us uh, this evening. And so thankfully, Vicki Ginoliak was uh, kind and gracious enough to accept uh, the invitation to uh, participate in the uh, judging. And Vicki, if you would, please stand up. Vicki is the Director of Sustainability for GRCC. Tom Smith, Director of Operations and Facilities, um, is our other judge. And Tanya Lofton, who is the uh, President of Student Congress, uh, is our third judge. So we wanted to have Thank you. We wanted to have uh, diverse uh, judging and, and criteria uh, also from, uh, from this team. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it back over to Liz. Good luck, everyone. OK. So um, class is going to, uh, again, queue up the video clip. We'll watch it, and then I will uh, I'll say the name of the team champion and ask you to bring your team on down. We are starting tonight with Pam Scott. Not again. I hate this. All I want to do is park my car and go to class. Is that too much to ask? I've been in line for the ramp for 25 minutes already. My test is about to start. I still have 18 cars ahead of me, and the ramp is still completely full. If only there were a way to reduce GRCC's need for on-campus parking by 50% by 2015. I think I can help. <laughs> Who are you? I'm the bus ferry. Why do you think I'm in this ridiculous outfit? OK, bus ferry, what's your great idea? I've got a plan. I think GRCC and the Rapid can team up. Here's how it would work. The Rapid would provide GRCC paperboard cards that include magnetic strips. These passes would allow free transportation on any of the Rapid's routes in Grand Rapids. GRCC would be able to choose its own design for the front of these cards, provided that the Rapid logo appears somewhere on the front. 
the RAPID reserves final approval on any card design. This is an example of the passes Kendall College currently uses. GRCC could hold a contest to design a new pass, promoting the new program. Every magnetic strip is encoded with a number unique to the card. If GRCC keeps track of which card is given to which student, the RAPID would be able to give GRCC records, including which passes were used, when they were used, and which route was taken. The RAPID could even turn off individual cards should they be lost, abused, or if a student drops out of GRCC. Every pass would be valid for the entirety of the semester. Each pass would automatically activate when it was first used on the RAPID. At the end of the semester, any activated pass would automatically be shut off by the RAPID. Participants would need to acquire a new pass for each semester. Regular fare rides for the RAPID is $1.50 per ride. For every ride taken using the suggested passes, GRCC would be charged 80 cents. With sufficient GRCC ridership, a high volume discount for this price could be negotiated in the future. Kendall has already been using a similar model to help alleviate their own parking problem. With student population of merely 1,500 people, Kendall students, faculty, and staff took over 24,000 rides last year. For the 2010-2011 school year, Kendall spent a little less than $20,000 on this program. Out of Kendall's 1,500 member population, 300 cards were issued, making for 20% participation rate. If 20% of GRCC's population were to participate in a similar program, approximately 3,000 cards would be issued. Fun fact, GRCC only has about 3,500 parking spaces available downtown between the four major parking sites to accommodate 15,000 students and 1,500 faculty and staff. Last year, GRCC had 782,000 individual instances of students parking on campus between the Barkley Ramp, Bostock Ramp, Line Ramp, and the DeVos Campus. If Kendall's ridership rates were applied to GRCC's student population of 15,000, GRCC would see a reduction in parking by almost 123,000 parks over the course of its first year. The numbers you see on the graph projected here indicate what would happen if we were to apply Kendall's rates to GRCC's population. You can see there's a significant dip in the summer, but that's mostly because Kendall suspended their program from May to August. August of 2011 saw ridership increase despite the fact that the program was only active for five days. This reduction would be likely to increase each semester as existing students who are already stuck in their on-campus parking routines move on to other institutions and a new batch of students enroll in Grand Rapids Community College. In addition, we recommend increasing the daily on-campus parking rate to $3.50, a dollar above the current rate. This would not only help GRCC obtain a sustainable source of income to cover the cost of the bus rides, it also encourages participation in the program by hitting students where it hurts, their wallets. If GRCC maintained Kendall's ridership rates, the estimated total cost for the first year would be $200,000. Assuming the remaining 80% of students who would not take advantage of this program would continue to park in the ramps, individual on-campus parking instances would drop to $625,000 per year. Collecting an additional dollar per parking instance would result in $625,000 to be used to sustain this partnership. As ridership increases, the number of individual automobiles traveling to GRC decreases. This results in a decrease in vehicle emissions and a positive impact on our environment. While riding the rapid, time that would otherwise be spent during a commute paying attention to the road could now be used for studying or even just a much needed mental break between GRCC and home. But the question remains, will Raiders ride the rapid? Last year, GRCC students were willing to pay $40 a month for a rapid pass offering unlimited rides for 31 days. By choosing to participate in this program, a student who would otherwise park on campus three days a week would save $42 a month by participating, over $100 per semester. Not to mention, when Raiders ride the rapid, they don't have to drive in the snow. All right, great job. Let's hear it. Okay, so uh, Pam Scott is a faculty champion, and uh, Pam, if you'll come down uh, with your team and uh, introduce your team to the judges. Hi, everybody. Um, our team was Raiders Ride the Rapid, and I was the faculty member, Leah Van Hardisfeld, is the staff member, and Doug um, Van Hardisfeld was our student member who is currently in class, so he wasn't able to be with us tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Well, what kind of questions do you guys have? Well, I have one to start off with. And uh, who would pay for the initial passes, monitor them, and maintain them here on campus? The passes um, would be paid for, the, the purchase of the passes are 30 cents a piece, and the rapid said that they would cover that cost. Um, my thinking is that the passes would be distributed to students, faculty, and staff when they pick up their Raider cards, and that way we could have a record of which card was given to which student. So yeah, apparently that would be student life. Okay, thank you. Good benchmarking against Kendall and nice data there. How about any other higher ed institutions in the greater Grand Rapids area? Are any of the other institutions using a similar approach? Um, Grand, Rep or Grand Valley is using um, free ridership for faculty, students, and staff, but their program is specific to their university because I believe they purchased their own buses and pay significant for bus routes. So that was not a good model for us. Um, we were also told that Spectrum recently instituted a, a program similar to this, and I understand Calvin and um, I believe Aquinas offer reduced fares. Um, where would the students park at to catch direct? Th they would be able to catch the bus at any bus stop in the city. So it also parks in Rapids, Rapid, not located all over the city, for those who have to travel into the city a little bit. So we thought this program could potentially reach a student population that perhaps does not have um, their own transportation and their only way to get to school would be a public um, transportation. So if I understand everything, um, you would have to take the rapid or pick it up at the appropriate bus stop or where the rapid currently stops. There wouldn't be anything added in the future. No. Okay, thank you. I guess that does it for us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Nice job. Okay. Great job, team one. Thank you. Um, the second presentation we're going to have is a student champion, um, and his name is Jacob Sterling. So, class, if you'll roll the video clip for us. My name is Jacob Sterling, and I'm here for the Armin Innovation Competition. My teammates Kelsey and Jeff were unable to be here because Kelsey is in a class and Jeff is tutoring in the calculus lab. Have you ever been running a tad late to get to school and seen the parking ramp full or a tremendous line of vehicles to get into the parking ramp? Yeah, it takes a long time to get in and chances are you can be late for class too. Well, there's a solution to that. One of them is to ride the rapid bus and park someplace off of campus so you can get to class and not have to worry about your car and not worry about parking it. And our plan it consisted of four parts. We had to talk to the rapid and see if there was a, a chance that they could alter some of their existing routes to swing closer to the, the campus. Our second part was to see if the frequency of the buses already in Trans transportation mode could be increased so there would be more buses flowing into campus or close to campus. The third part, we would conduct a survey of area businesses to see if they would let us use their parking lot for students, a few students, not a whole, a whole bunch of students. And then the last part of the plan would be to increase awareness of the rapid and its advantages of using it. The first part of the plan, it consisted of altering the routes. And upon investigation into this, um, this question, I took an interview with Kevin Whistlink from the Rapid, and he said that it's incredibly hard to alter the routes at the Rapid because there's the only, the only way to alter them is with millages, and millages don't come about very often. Um, so that 
was a block or a brick wall that we hit, so we couldn't go very far with that. But we also or we came up with other solutions to that problem. The second part of the plan was to see if the frequency of the buses could be increased. And in a, or actually, the rapid has that plan already in place in their uh, transit master plan phase one. And some of the ideas for this phase include the to increase the frequency by making every route available every 30 minutes from 5 o'clock to 7.15. The second part, or another part of the plan, was to extend the hours of all routes to 11.15 p.m. on weekday evenings. And another part of the route is the seven busiest routes will have 30 minute service until 12.15 a.m. Now these are only a three of probably seven or eight different plans and the full details are available at rapidtmp.org. The interview with Kevin, he shared with me that they are adding a new bus line called the Silver Line Bus System. And that bus system will travel down Division Street and around to Medical Mile and to Central Station. Now the really cool things about this, this route is that they travel in bus lanes, so they don't have to worry about regular traffic and red lights and the lanes are just empty and they're only made for buses. The other, another thing is, is that you can pay for the bus route on electronic means. So you can pay for it before you get on the bus, thus decreasing the boarding time. Another thing is, is that they will offer 10 minute service from morning to afternoon commute and a trip from 60th Avenue to Medical Mile will take approximately 27 minutes without any transfers. And also, they have state-of-the-art technology, so it, um, it'll give you real-time information and much more. The last part of the plan was to check with area businesses to see if they would like, or if they would let students park in their lots and ride the buses. So I conducted a survey of some major businesses on the Alpine Highway, and I asked Home Depot, Meyer, Kohl's, Walmart, and Sam's Club, and I asked them if they would let students park there for free or a discounted rate. Most of the answers consisted of 10 to 15 cars, and there couldn't be any more than 20 or 30 because they have to have room for their employees and their patrons so they couldn't extend all the lots. Special exceptions to this 10 to 15 car rate were, were Kohl's and Walmart. I think, I think that this plan should be implemented because for one, it, it uses ideas that are already in place and are already working very well. And it is just so easy to ride the bus. Okay. Good job. Jacob, do you want to come on down and answer some of the judges' questions? Thank you for doing this competition. It was a lot of fun, a lot of stuff to learn. So, Good evening, Jacob. Um, I do have a quick question for you. How many cars do you think that would eliminate from parking on campus here? It's not known right now. I only conducted a few um, surveys for a few businesses because I had limited time, but there were there are many other businesses that we could ask on Alpine, on 28th Street, on even Rivertown Crossings Mall. They have large parking lots that we could ask and see what they said. Um, it's hard to say exactly, but it, I think it shows promise. Okay, thank you. Jacob, thank you again for participating. Very nice. Um, are you proposing a similar approach that this plan would apply to employees and their traffic patterns as well as students? If employees want to use it as well, that would be fine. I don't see any problem with that. Um, I think it could go for anyone who wants to use the facilities here at CC. Uh, 
Um, you mentioned um, in your video that the bus would pick up as far uh, uh, for along 60th to Medical Mile nonstop. Is it just 60th me Medical Mile? And what if students are coming from other places? Is it more than just that route? For right now, they're only planning on adding that one route from 60th down division up to Medical Mile, and then it'll circle circle around in um, Grand Rapids a little bit before it goes to Central Station. Um, I think I um, heard from Kevin when I interviewed him down at the the Rapid that they they may add more of the Silver Line style bus routes, so that would be later on, of course. But I think this one could be here as early as next summer. Um, you said they only allow 15 cars to park there at a time? Or? On average, it was 10 to 15 cars because they have to have room for patrons and their employees. M Meyer has a carpool lot out in front of their store between the crossroad and the gas station, and it, it's kind of a small lot. So I, when I talked to the manager there, she's like, yeah, we can't have more than 20 or 30 cars because we, have, we still have to have room for our employees. And that pretty much held f the same for all the businesses that I visited. So we'd have to significantly canvas and see how many businesses would like to participate. Thank you. Jake, in your, in your uh, test research at all, were you able to hypothesize the various geographical locations that we'd have to look at identifying off-campus distance sites around the service area based on where students are coming from? Uh, can you rephrase that? Uh, well, we have a very large service area, so yeah. Alpine is just one area of that. Do you have any idea based on volume or where students would come from, how many different kind of park and ride type arrangements with either area businesses or something in and in what areas we'd have to first think about putting them um, to, to best serve the various student population and where they're coming from? We are were, we were unable to get students locations, for, um, so it, we couldn't specifically get that data, but various, we could visit many places, so. Well, thank you, and I think uh, we're being timed out here. Yes, we, we're, we're holding through to uh, videos. We're limited to uh, a, around a five minute time frame and, and uh, three minutes or so for Q&A with the judges so we can get through all the teams tonight. Um, nice job, Jacob. Our next um, idea comes from Nathaniel Shapiro and uh, Nathaniel is a student champion as well. Class, if we can roll that video. We've all seen what the ramp is like when it gets like this up close. But wouldn't this be a much better site? Hi. I'm Nathan. I'm Dave. And I'm Eddie. Have you ever arrived in time for an important class only to discover that there's no parking spot left on the campus? Have you ever felt that the time that you spend in class could be used more effectively? And have you ever been unable to take the class you needed or wanted because it simply wasn't offered at the ti right time of the day? Our team's idea for this year's RMAN Innovation Challenge is about just those sorts of situations. This year, the Innovation Challenge at GRCC asked students su to suggest ways to reduce the need for and use of on-campus parking by 50%. We thought about why we come into school, to get, to get an education, of course, and we re realized that the way we schedule things around here isn't really the best use of students' time, money, and patience. At first, we thought about online classes. That would be an easy solution. If people don't have to come into class, they don't have to park. But GRCC already offers online class options, and many people find that format to be a poor fit for them. There are benefits to live, in-person teaching that just can't be replicated outside of the classroom. At the same time, online classes can offer new ways to learn and interactive technologies that are difficult or too awkward to use in a classroom setting. So why not look at hybrid classes? 
A hybrid class, which has both an online component and traditional lectures, gives students and also teachers the best of both worlds. But it turns out hybrids don't get much attention at GRCC. There are very few hybrid options compared to online classes. We set out to find out why and to see if increasing the number of hybrids at GRCC would be possible and well received by both teachers and students. The first question we asked students was, are there any subjects or particular classes that you would have liked to take in a hybrid format or online format but were unavailable? Next, we asked if there were classes that they were hesitant about taking online but would still be willing to take as a hybrid. We interviewed 124 students at different times, different locations around campus. We found that over 40% of them did have classes that they would be interested in taking as a hybrid. So there definitely seems to be unmet demand for both kinds of distance learning classes, especially hybrids. We also asked teachers how they felt about hybrids. Most of the staff has little experience teaching online and are optimistic but hesitant. There are two general worries for teachers, the responsibility of the students and the difficulty that can come with administering a class online. But these concerns are significantly lessened for hybrid classes where there is still regular personal contact between teachers and students. To our surprise, even among those who teach online classes, there are even fewer who have experience with hybrids. It seems that hybrid formats have been largely overlooked. If GRCC were to make better use of hybrid classes, the best type of hybrid would first have to be determined. The best way to teach math may not be the best way to teach creative writing. Take a lecture that meets three days a week. Suppose it will now meet only twice a week, with some parts put online. That conveniences students and frees up parking spaces. But we've noticed already that the parking ramps are only full during certain peak hours of the day. Hybrid classes allow for an alternating schedule that enables more classes and more busy students to fit in the most highly demanded time slots. Instead of three classes meeting on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, in a limited space on campus, four classes could occupy that same time and space if each of them takes turns skipping one day. No more missing out on the best times and days. This way, more people can fit the schedule they need. We wanted to figure out how other schools may have implemented expanded distance learning and online programs so that we could get some sense of how we could do the same without compromising and instead improve on the quality of students' education. It turns out that the University of California school system has been doing just that for a long time. There, they decided to do, to do an experiment, to put course materials and some elements, which is slightly different for each subject, online not so much to free up parking spaces, but to free up class time for more productive tasks that can't be done elsewhere. They had a lot of success, even going so far as to make new interactive digital textbooks, and they attribute that in large part to the teamwork of the entire school system. Putting materials online in a way that frees teachers from repetitive jobs managing their classes, jobs that could be automated, takes time. With a group, that, with a group effort over several years, they managed to do it right. So how would GSEC see that kind of success and also free some parking spaces? GRCC would need to experiment with different models, like making classes time to be only for workshop work, and asking questions why lectures are online in the coming semester to determine what works best in each subject area. It will also have to be a group effort with the entire department to conduct the experiments and riffing the teaching style and building out the course materials. We want to get a feel for how the teachers would be to the new format and see if there would be any volunteers to try out the different formats. We counted more than a dozen professors across the multiple departments, and we think the answer is that yes, the staff is ready and willing. Thank you for taking the time to consider our proposal. Okay, Nathaniel, are you here? There you are, okay, you wanna come on down and Introduce uh, who's ever on your team that's with you here tonight. Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm Eddie. Uh, our third member, Dave Friday, who's a professor here, couldn't be here tonight. He has a Calc 2 exam he has to administer. Uh, so. I'm just curious, did you do any uh, research on finding out or trying to develop how many cars would be eliminated from the parking lots with the classes that you talked about from the hybrid? Well, uh, to determine how many people uh, would be basically put off campus, it would depend on two things, the number of people that would be taking the new format that were previously not, and uh, the type of hybrid class that's being used. The only important thing about that is how much of it is put online. Uh, something we didn't mention in the video is that technically speaking, a hybrid class is 50% or more online. 
Uh, but we aren't necessarily talking about that. We're talking about maybe only putting a small fraction, maybe one of the lectures put online. Any proportion that might be possible uh, gets people off campus. Were there any other schools other than Cal that uh, has this? Uh, there are quite a few. Um, most of them do everything a little bit differently. Uh, Calif the University of California system was the most extensive example uh, we've ever seen, so we focused on that. Uh, between the various schools, they have about a quarter million students and faculty and everyone who is in total participating in that. Uh, and they've seen, uh, it, w it wasn't done so much for parking there, it was done more to improve the quality of their education, but they saw, because they made it mandatory for introductory classes, almost complete adoption. Uh, some other schools that have uh, done that uh, include a lot, several Ivy Leagues, uh, like Stanford, uh, they put a lot of course materials online. Uh, there's a little bit of hesitation to credit those, but it's, it's on the way up. From the survey that you did with the students, were there any recurring subjects out of that survey that came, yes, this would be really good in a hybrid format, or absolutely not, don't do this in a hybrid, we need that face-to-face? -face. Yeah, so computer, the computer science department here, uh, all of their courses lend itself very well uh, to online formats in particular. Uh, they already offer a lot of online classes. There, were, there was a little bit of demand across all the departments for hybrids where there wasn't any for, for uh, online classes. A little bit there, most of the demand that we saw uh, was about English and math. Uh, mostly for the introductory classes, people, there was a little bit, bit of a discrepancy. The professors seemed to think it would work better for only the upper level classes, you know, the uh, most difficult because they assume the students are. Yeah. Um, right now, we think that lots of, of students would traditionally love to, you know, come to class and have the direct interaction with the, the teachers. But we think in the future that as the internet get more advanced and stuff like that, and the students who get more comfortable to staying at home and still get access to their material in class, and as as per instructors get more, you know, used to accustomed to, you know, teaching the online classes, plus about thirty three point three percent, which is one third of the week that we we meet online, was wasn't, wasn't that bad. So right now we're just gonna implement it in into, you know. Uh, 100 level math, you know, basic level math or English compositions. But in the future, we may implement it into science classes. Of course, the, with um, with chemistry or you know physics, who those classes who have the lab, then there's no other way that we students have to go to, um, to the campus. But lectures, if we meet like two times or three times a week, probably one time in in out of three times we can we can you know conduct the um, online materials. About that, uh, for example, lab is is one example of something that can't be replicated online. It has to be done in person. But when you think about when you're in class, most the most I don't want to say wasted, but things that can be replicated completely online is just the lecture. The only thing that's different is the inability to get questions and feedback in real time. And there are a lot of tools that are already available, although it's more or less a staff decision not to use them. Some te some teachers do use them very well, but we think it just requires a little bit of encouragement. Uh, really, as we've seen in other schools, uh, online classes that are that are that are accompanied with uh, in-person components work very well, and there really isn't any kind of drop that's normally seen with pure online classes in student performance. And a lot of teachers were very optimistic about that, and they were interested in participating and uh, seeing where that goes. Okay, awesome. So we are at team four, so we're gonna be at our halfway point here. Um, this is a staff champion, uh, Bruce Morrison. So class, if you'll roll that clip, and then Bruce, you'll come on down with your team. Okay, there are a couple things we have to do first. First thing we have to do is we have to get a survey posted to Blackboard to find out what the student opinions are of carpooling with incentives. The second thing we need to do is actually hand out the incentives and see what their reactions are. That's a great idea. Let's start off with the hundred dollars that we have. Carpooling. You guys are carpooling today. Sharing your ride. But because you're carpooling, we're going to pay for your parking today. Two dollars and fifty cents. Okay. Thanks for, for carpooling. carpooling. Certainly. We're doing a study, and we're paying you for your parking today for carpooling. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we need to change our message. <laughs> 
It's okay, let's keep going. We're a study on carpooling to see if people will carpool if we give them incentive to park. So we're paying you for your parking today. Really? Yeah, $2.50. Thank you. All right. We're doing a study on carpooling. Okay. And we're seeing if people will carpool if we give them incentive. So we're gonna pay for your parking today. What? Yeah, it's you 50. still gotta swipe, but you get the money enough. right away. Right here, there's two fifty in there. Thank you. All right. <laughs> hey, has anybody seen Bruce? I haven't seen Bruce for weeks. Hello, aren't there more carpoolers? Bruce. 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 Man, it's getting cold. I know. Let's go ask his wife. Have you seen Bruce by any chance? You know, I've been wondering where he is myself. Hmm. I'm so cold. Hi, Mom. I'm at school. Where's Dad? He's supposed to pick me up. Hey! I think iPads killed him. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably in trouble. <laughs> I just came back from Butterworth, and Bruce was admitted with frostbite. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Well, let's look at the Blackboard responses. Over 3,700 responses, and 55% said yes to carpooling. So that's a good idea? Maybe we should come up with another plan for the incentives. Well, maybe the carpoolers can swipe using a separate radar card. Let's give that a try. But first, let's spring Bruce out of jail or out of the hospital. <laughs> Good idea. After talking with the radar card guru, Paulo, here's how it's going to work. A separate reader will keep track of each student's scan and reward the driver of the carpoolers at the end of the day. For carpoolers with two riders, they will scan the carpooler reader twice. One dollar off, another dollar off, scan to get into the parking lot. For cars with three carpoolers or more, they'll scan three times. One dollar off, two dollars off, free parking for everybody, then scan to get in. You know, the plan actually sounds pretty easy because the students don't have to sign up anywhere. All they do is show up, scan their card, and go into the parking structure. But how are students going to pay for it? That is part of the question, of course, who's going to pay for it? Maybe we start with one parking lot on a trial basis. If that works, we may have to raise fees to make it all balance out. That might be an incentive to have students participate. And you think of all of the, the benefits of this program now. Cars no longer backed up on the streets feeding into parking ramps. Fewer pedestrian vehicle interactions and fewer accidents. Less pollution, less carbon, more available spots for parking more spots that we could sell to nearby organizations. Fewer police officers needed to guide traffic into parking ramps. Here's how we're going to pay for it. Figuring a hypothetical count of 6,000 cars using all the spaces on a busiest day, the total revenue is approximately $15,000. If we raise the fee to $3 and give a dollar per rider to people who are carpooling, we'll still end up with around $15,000. If we raise it to $350, 40% of vehicles will have carpooling students. If we raise it to $4, we will reach our target of 50% of the vehicle having carpooling students. And the total revenue will be $16,000. So in summary, I think our idea is the best idea, offering incentives to carpoolers. And through the Blackboard survey, 55% of students said yes to carpooling. In our plan, we start out with incentives Reducing the cost to park. If two people come in, we reduce it by a dollar per person. If three or more people come in, they park for free. Using that method, in three years, by 2015, we will reduce the number of cars coming to park by 50%. Everyone wins. <laughs> okay. Bruce and team, come on down. Okay. 
I'm Bruce Morrison. Uh, following right behind me is Chani Tan. And Greg Forbes is our faculty member. Good evening. Good presentation there. But I do have a quick question for you. How do I validate the number of riders in the car? So if I come in and I'm by myself and I swipe it three or four times, I get free parking. Um, during the video shoot, uh, we only had um, one card, so I couldn't. But basically, you'd have to get everybody's card who's riding in the car. So I each see. individual person would scan through the carpool reader. OK, got it. Thank you. Yep. Takes care of the dishonesty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm envisioning a backup down ransom as the riders are trying to find their Raider cards in the bottom of their bags. So from a time perspective, Bruce, did you calculate again? I, we're driving in, we're chatting, all of a sudden we get there and to take advantage of that benefit. We do need to swipe each individual's card? That is correct. They'll have to pass them to the driver and swipe it through. But because we're lowering the number of cars coming in, um, it actually would balance out or actually be in the favor of moving cars more quickly into the lot. Yes, and also the probability, of, the probability of a car of three people not knowing their, where their cars are would be equal to the probability of three independent cars <laughs> not knowing where it is. <laughs> it's a wash. Right. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're writing in the And if I may, in a student's perspective, I would take the time if I knew that I was able to save on paying for parking. So question would be, um, have you guys researched about having like student life keep track of like whenever you have a carpool of people, is there like a system that they can somehow just swipe in and then go to student life and get like a ticket or something that they can use to get back out or something like that? Or um, Because I, um, I was envisioning like all the cars lining up versus like everybody taking their time, swiping four cards or three cards at, cards at a time. Um, possibly in some kind of we, we tried to automate it as much as possible. Um, there are many plans where people have to sign up ahead of time. Um, this kind of circumvents that. And basically, you can just decide on the day, you know, if you're picking people up, you come in, you get rewarded right away. It's all electronic. So. Um, at least if you have the Raider card. If you come in and you pull a ticket, if you still have um, carpoolers in your car on the way out, you would get the dollar off per person on the way out. So. Have you um, seen any other campuses or any other colleges, universities, community colleges try this? Uh, we did some research on the web. There's one college that actually credits the Raider card a certain amount. Um, Basically, uh, we fo tried to follow the pattern that they offered, and that was if you have two people in the car, you pay half price. If you have three or more, you don't have to pay at all. So when we got to 2015 and the rate was $4, if you give each of the two drivers a dollar, then that would be a $2 fee off of you know, the driver's Raider card, and then free for everybody else if you have three or more. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We had a lot of fun doing it. Awesome. Wow. What great staff, students, and faculty we have here on this campus. Innovators all over the place. It's amazing. I love it. OK, our next um, team is led by a faculty champion, Mark Dodd. Uh, class, roll the tape, and then Mark will have you come down with your team. Hello, my name is Mark Dodd. And I'm Ken Hyde. And together, our idea is to use carpooling here at the college to try to reduce the number of parking spaces needed by 2015. Not just carpooling, though. We'd like to provide an incentive to the students to try to help reduce some of the parking spaces needed. I'd like to show you, first of all, some of the benefits of carpooling. I pulled up a website here called rideshare.com. Ken's going to be helping me here as we read some of this information. But just to discuss some of the benefits of carpooling. Some of the lines that stick out to me here is the average household uses 1,143 gallons of gas per year. 
It's expected that the numbers of cars and trucks on an already crowded highway will double within the next 30 years. Clearly, ride sharing or carpooling can be a benefit as far as reducing the amount of gallons of gas that are used each year. Uh, some more lines that stand out to me. The average American spends 434 hours in his or, car, his or her car each year. In driving your car 20,800 miles a year emits 23,600 pounds of CO2. Certainly that's something that we can reduce by implementing a rideshare or a carpooling program. So in our attempts to set up some type of a carpooling system or ridesharing system, uh, I went out to another website. This one is eRideshare.com. Just to show what is available or maybe something that could be used here at the college, certainly to put information out there concerning uh, who needs a ride, what time, what time they might arrive, what time they might get back. I think this website is a good tool that could be used maybe to mimic or to at least give us some idea of what we can do here at the college, maybe setting up a web page on grcc.edu that can act in a similar fashion as this so that students can understand who needs a ride, maybe who's in the area, maybe people they didn't even realize that were in their area. So here I'll talk about the uh, ways that we can track uh, which students carpool and who they carpool with. Uh, I've created a simple database model uh, that could be easily integrated into the college's current system. Uh, you can search by name uh, to, get the, to get the details of everything that that driver or rider did. You can search by date. You can search for a specific date or a date range. You could search for a single person by month or everybody by month. So as you can see here, the, the possibilities of being able to, to find people and, and, and see not just on an honor system, but with real data, how, how this could easily be implemented and tracked to provide some sort of incentive for students. After talking to the IT department, we've decided that in order to prevent anybody from misusing this system, we would have to install a second card reader on the passenger side of the vehicle for passengers to swipe their cards as they were carpooling. We would have to also then network to the server room. So we do realize that in order for this to be all implemented, it will be an additional cost to the college. We think there can be some good benefits to the college. Uh, good benefits such as improving morale of the students. Trying to get a parking spot in the middle of the day is clearly one of the, the major issues here at the college. And so we think uh, maybe eliminating some of those reasons why students might not have shown up to class, this could be a good way to provide benefits to the college. We'd also like to uh, consider the, the use of incentives, trying to give a reason for the students to actually carpool here. Maybe an incentive such as uh, giving money back to the students, maybe per instance or per week based upon how many times they carpool. Certainly if the students see that the college is trying to, to give back to the students for their good choices, uh, that would be something that would increase the morale here at the college as well. Some of the other incentives that have come to our minds are maybe allowing certain parking spots to be used for carpooling, maybe sp parking spots that are closer to the main building or the ATC building, or even using parking permits, giving special permits to students who are in this rideshare or carpooling program. Some of the ideas that we feel set us apart from the rest of the contestants are that we, talk, we spoke to IT and we've come to the conclusion that it would be a great idea to install the second card reader on the passenger side of the vehicle and that we've also displayed here how easy it will be to create a simple database to build off of already what exists to create and generate reports to see who's carpooling. Bruce, we like your idea. Can we split? Can we split if we win? Good evening. Yeah, I guess you sort of mirror each other there, but uh, what campuses, or have you looked at any of the campuses that tried something like this? I'm going to pass this on to Ken. You did some research on other campuses. Um, you know, some of the, some of the uh, other schools around the country do a similar program, and, and the struggle is always to, to prevent the abuse 
um, to, to make sure that everybody's honest. And, and the way that we came up with that is we, we spoke to uh, Paulo Tellis uh, with the Student Life Associate Center. Um, and his kind of idea was to do the second card reader but put it on the passenger side. And in order to cover the cost of that, it would be about $5,000 um, for the reader, the installation of all the interfaces, you know, to, to network it to the server. And, you know, that's the way we think it would work the best. Uh, some of the other colleges that we had looked at, um, they were talking about the parking permit for students if they signed up, also the carpooling spaces closer to buildings. That was some of the ideas that had come on our research to other colleges. Thank you. Sure. Let me mention a little bit more. Um, the original idea also considered books, giving back to students for the cost of books. And maybe that could be used as a marketing tool to just kind of uh, increase more students to, to get them into the carpooling, saying, hey, if we, get, if we can give you back a dollar or two dollars towards the purchase of your books, would you be more apt to carpool? And certainly during, uh, right now with the bookstore doing the, the book buyback, I mean, if we market that together, we think that that's something that could really be something that the students would really pick up on and say, yeah, and, and tell other friends and if we market it really well. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, we're on to our final three teams of the night. Um, the next team um, is Christine. Um, so class, if you'll roll that video. Hi, I'm Christine Davis, and I work in the Human Resources Department here at GRCC. I'm Michelle Davis, and I'm a student here at GRCC. And I'm Mike Light, and I'm a faculty member here at GRCC. I teach history in the Social Science Department. Today, we're going to be talking about our idea for the Armin Award Contest, which is using UVU here at GRCC. Christine, could you tell the folks uh, why we decided to use UVU as our project? Absolutely. Our idea is that we would use video conferencing software for faculty and staff as means of communication. This would reduce the number of students driving to campus to meet with their instructors, adjuncts meeting students on campus, and students meeting to work on group projects. Specifically, we would start this project by implementing faculty using UVU for office hours. Once successful, the software could be used in other ways around campus. With the busy lives of students and faculty, this software will help enable people to work together and create relationships while eliminating the reliance on parking and contributing to the sustainability efforts here at GRCC. Michelle, what do you think some of the benefits will be to students at GRCC if we adopt UVU? Well, as you know, most college students have quite a tight budget, and so this will elim eliminate the need for us to drive to campus and park and spend money on gas and parking ramps. It will also save time with our busy schedules with working and school in order to contact our professors on our own time. It also allows us to have quick responses because as we all know, some professors don't email us back as quickly as we would like them to. It allows us the ability to show our instructor an assignment in question with desktop sharing while we're video chatting with them and video message with important class information can be saved and viewed while studying. It makes it easy for students to meet with other students during group projects and share documents and update projects all while working from home. And I will also be more likely to ask questions of my instructor in this seemingly less formal setting. This also enhances the ability to offer online classes at GRCC while still providing a full service class by recording lectures and distributing them to students via UVU or Blackboard. This would give students the ability to meet with their groups weekly on UVU for discussions, projects, or other assignments, and non-traditional students would be more likely to continue their educational goals and could be more successful in this type of learning environment. Mike, what do you think the benefits are for faculty? I see a lot of benefits for faculty. Um, many of them are enhancements to things that we're already doing here at GRCC. Um, some of them would include the ability to offer extended uh, times for office hours uh, that would work best for students with busy schedules and faculty schedules. Um, I could serve more students in a limited amount of time using the chat room uh, version of UVU. And students are more likely to ask questions of instructors if they don't have to come in and meet with them face to face. So I think this is a great uh, addition to what we're doing here. 
Um, the ability to allow students to learn a new technology that's currently being used in the field in terms of uh, interviewing and HR processes is a good thing as well, preparing them for the next step in their lives. Um, another added benefit of UVU would be allowing faculty members to participate in departmental initiatives and meetings if they're away at conferences or providing an ability for us to connect with uh, faculty members at our um, off-site locations. Christine, you have a lot of experience studying the success stories of UVU at other institutions. Could you share with us some of those stories? Absolutely. I took a class that was a 16-week class at Grand Valley State University, um, and it was Labor and Employment Law with Professor Swift. The class required all assignments to be submitted via UVU. We had to record video messages and send them to our instructor to explain our understanding of the concepts that we had studied in class. Nobody in class had used the software prior, and everybody was comfortable and happy with the online integration. Some of the benefits that we noticed during the class as students was during a sick day or during a time that we were sick, we were able to attend class without um, actually having to be there. We could still listen and participate in the discussions um, from home. And then also, when there were poor driving conditions, which there were many last semester, um, some people that lived in Muskegon and other surrounding areas that had more snowfall, they were able to also attend via UVU. These are the steps that we see to implement this idea on campus. First, communicate the new initiative and provide training and download information to those people using the software. Then, notify IT of the change so they can also support the new technology and new software. Part of this process will require us to purchase webcam and microphone pieces for each full-time faculty member to use here at GRCC. And then we'll have to implement UVU for off-campus staff and faculty meetings as well. Then, long-term, we can start offering classes online where students can attend from home and watch real-time lectures. Then, we'll watch the parking problem here disappear. Great job, Christine. Christine Davis, staff champion, come on down and field these judges' questions. Hi. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, quick question for you. Uh, how much do you think the whole UVU process would cost for the college? And or is there any financial implication to the students? Um, it depends on the route that we go with UVU. Um, I did estimate, um, well, actually, the UVU licenses by themselves, like, you don't have to purchase a business license. It's a free software that you can use and download. Um, and that would give you six screens, like it was showing those people waving. It would give you those six screens. If you wanted to upgrade and go to a business version to get 12 screens, then there's additional costs and implications for that. Um, I'm not sure how those costs would be distributed, but I'd assume um, part of that might go to the students. I would hope not, but um, if we went to that route, it might. Okay, so therefore, a student would not need uh to purchase anything, just download it. Oh, um, they would need a webcam and a microphone, and those are about $20 to add to a computer. And most computers that students are purchasing now, if they are purchasing a computer for home, are already um, right in the computer itself. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, ladies, how are you? Did you do any comparison um, from functionality perspective as to how UVU integrates with our existing Blackboard system or where there would be duplication or how this would provide functionality that currently isn't available? Um, we do have Wimba Pronto, um, and I've used that as well. And we have, or we did look at that a little bit. Wimba is a little, what I believe is less user friendly and you actually have to click a button to talk and only one person can be talking at a time, and you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction. You can see the professor speaking, but you can't see the other students in the room, so it doesn't create that connection. Um, you are able to save video messages that you want to send to a class, and then you could upload those to Blackboard and send them that way. Mm -hmm. Hi. <clears throat> um, you've answered um, two of my questions, actually. Um, <laughs> Um, but <laughs> I was actually um, also wondering, for those who are computer, not everybody's computer literate, mm -hmm. is there um, like a process or it, have you guys researched like with the technology people 
if students call, would they be able to help them out to get started with Voodoo, or how would that work? Yeah, um, we actually, as our st first step, would be training and working with IT in order to have that support available for both faculty and students. Yep. Thank you very much. You got it? Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, Team seven is led by a student champion, uh, Cadence. And uh, class, if you will roll that clip. Hi, I'm Cadence Mercer Curtis, student at GRCC. Laura Byers, adjunct faculty member. And I'm Mary Beth Beagley, staff development. And this is our Innovations 2011 presentation. Our initiative combines three different components to it. The first is a partnership with the Rapid and Myers Grocery Stores. Second, we have a partnership with local affiliations such as local churches, organizations, and businesses. And the third piece involves a semester city pass on the bus. Our partnership with the Grand Rapids Bus Transportation System, also known as the Rapid, includes three new bus routes with free parking for students, faculty, and staff. These would be direct lines that would bring students to and from uh, Meyer Grocery Store to GRCC. These bus routes would be located in central locations that are dictated by our student demographics. And the third piece is going to be semester bus passes on other Grand Rapids transportation lines where students can get a semester long pass at a reduced price. The Rapid will charge Grand Rapids Community College 80 cents per ride per user for the semester passes. The three new bus lines cost will depend on the hours that we're using them, the frequency of service, and the number of days throughout each semester. We've estimated the annual cost for this to be roughly $349,000. Now some of this cost will be able to uh, be alleviated when we figure in the student pricing that GRCC will charge students to use these services. As previously stated, we have chosen the bus locations based on demographic data that we have gathered through the student registrar's office. We have a total of 17,569 students here at GRCC, and of those students, 40% live in the city of Grand Rapids and could use um, nearby parking, perhaps walk to GRCC, or even use inner city uh, public transportation. The 42% live in outlying areas in the northeast, southeast, and west of Grand Rapids. Based off this data, we have chosen centralized locations for shuttle pickups. To support our idea with the shuttles, we decided to distribute a survey to student staff and faculty via online newsletters, the GRCC Today, we also conducted in-person surveys uh, on campus and in our classes. From those surveys, 62.5 indicated that they were highly likely to use the survey or to use the bus shuttle system, and 23.1% indicated they would potentially use the system but would need more information. These are just some graphs that illustrate both the students' locations around West Michigan and a graph that illustrates our survey results if the students would utilize the bus system. Based on a cost of approximately 80 cents per ride for the city bus passes provided by the Rapid Grand Rapids city system, GRCC could charge about $100 for semester pass per student. And those students or faculty or staff who decided to use that pass system would realize a minimum savings of approximately $60 per semester on parking. This is based on parking once a day. Um, so students who park twice a day would realize even more savings, depending upon their schedules. The third prong of our plan is the community parking involvement. And this is a great piece, really involving the surrounding community with our uh, GRCC community. Um, this would be an opportunity for students, staff, and faculty to utilize a local parking space that goes unused most of the time. This parking would be available at a lower cost to students, faculty, and staff than on-campus parking. We've spoken with various organizations around this area, around Grand Rapids Community College, who are interested in leasing spaces to us. 
here we have a list of some of the organizations that already said we would definitely commit spaces, uh, such as St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Other organizations that are not listed were very, very interested, but felt they would need a definite commitment to bring it to committees or make a, a final decision. Some of this parking was as low as $1.75 a day, and those parking spaces could be used by more than one student. So we were thinking perhaps a lottery for daytime students and evening students to utilize that parking space. This would make best use of those available parking spaces in the downtown area. The three of us sincerely believe that using our three-prong program, new shuttle buses, area city buses, and community parking will allow GRCC to reduce parking needs by 50% in the coming three years. Just hop on the bus, Gus. Hop on the bus, Gus. You don't need to discuss much. Just drop off the key and get yourself free. Our three dynamic ladies, <laughs> come on down and face the judges' questions. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Cadence Mercer Curtis. This is Mary Beth, and this is Laura. I get the first question this time. All right. Already, um, my first question or question is, um, where would the students purchase these services? Would they continue to purchase these at Student Life or? We did think they would purchase them at Student Life. We thought that would be the best place. Um, a lot of students, I know where Student Life is. It's an easy access place, and it's the place where to get you get your uh, Raider cards. So to get the semester passes there. Um, especially would be very convenient, I feel, for them. So the discounts would already be included. Once you go to purchase, they already have the discount. Mm -hmm. what? I will have that song stuck in my head now for the rest <laughs> of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you tomorrow. <laughs> um, did you talk with the Rapid? They were open to three new bus routes, and where? what routes are you proposing? Um, okay. We did talk to the Rapid, actually. Um, we talked with Brian Pouget. And the three different locations for the direct routes would be at, let me look at my notes, um, the Myers in Rivertown, or by Rivertown Crossing, the Meyer on 28th Street in Kalamazoo, and then the Meyer over by Knapp Street Corner. And he was, he was very interested when I spoke to him. Um, he Actually, he's the one who put together the cost, the estimated cost right. for GRCC. We spoke plenty of times. Um, and Meyer and the Rapid already have, you know, community or a partnership there. You identified uh, several organizations up there for a dollar seventy-five approximately, where you can park and so on. Uh, are those numbers valid? I, uh, when I say valid, are they uh, similar for every organization? A dollar seventy-five. They are actually um, they're different. The dollar seventy-five um, is with. Um, it was the low. It was the low end. There are some that were more expensive, but the the good part is, is with a, a good coordinator, you could put you know two students a day in those parking spaces, those for morning and those for night, and that would make it cheaper. Um, St. Mark's Episcopal Church actually had 15 freed spaces at the end of November. They were six dollars a day, but had the availability to have as many cars as you wanted in that spot. It would be. Um, so $6 a day is quite expensive, but split between two or three students um, with how close it is, is actually, it's not bad. Uh, LaGrave Church had a $35 a month, um, and Emmanuel Lutheran gives monthly passes for $80, and I spoke with him briefly, and he said that multiple cars in that space would be negotiable as well. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so there's some themes going on here tonight, but slight differences in how people would go about uh, getting these implemented. Uh, so our final team is led by a student champion, Kim Ladwick. Class, roll the tape.
Hi, I'm Deb Bride. I work in the General Counsel's Office as Labor Relations Generalist. And I'm Lisa Gleig. I'm an Assistant Professor in the Social Sciences Department. And I'm Kimberly Ladewig, full-time student. Our proposal to reduce parking by 50% on campus is to offer free parking for students willing to carpool. Hey Deb. Oh. Kim, where have you been? I have been driving around the parking ramp looking for a good spot. It is crazy parking out there. Oh. And we have to pay for it, like it's so expensive. I know, I picked up a couple extra shifts to cover the cost. Oh, that's awful. And then after my night classes, I have to walk back to the car alone and that makes me super nervous. What'd you get? Oh my gosh. I got a message from some starfish saying that if I miss my nine o'clock class oh. one more time, I'm gonna get kicked out. Oh no, I know those like 9 a.m. classes are so hard to get to. I've even missed a few. Well, I just can't get up in the morning. That's awful. I just wish I knew people at GRCC. I'm really shy and it's really hard to meet people in my classes. You know, I just saw that poll on Blackboard last week. 55% of students would actually carpool if they got free parking. I wonder, you know what, we did something with Student Congress as well, and they, the highest recommended idea was free parking. I wonder if we could get GRCC to give free parking to people that carpool. That would be so great if we got free parking, if we carpooled together. That, that would save me would so much awesome. <laughs> free parking would be great. Hmm. I still don't see how it would get me out of bed in the morning, though. <laughs> You know what, I bet if I was in your driveway at 8.30 in the morning blaring my horn at you, you would get out of bed. Yeah, I guess I'd have to. But how would I meet people that I could carpool with? Oh, I just saw a great website. Yeah. It's called West Michigan Rideshare, and GRCC has teamed up with a Rapid uh -huh. to help students find other students to ride to school with. It's super easy, you just put your name in, contact information and where you live and it sets it all up for you. Oh, so you just fill in your information there? Yeah, and it took like less than 10 minutes to do. That's great. Wouldn't it be even better if they had a special lot just for carpoolers so we didn't have to wait in those lines? Oh, I would love that. That would be great. I love that I'm not nervous walking back from my night class alone. And with her in my driveway honking her horn, I haven't missed one class. And I've made friends at GRCC now. I think I'm going to come back next semester. Plus, with all the money we saved, we stop for coffee. We can reduce on-campus parking by 50%, reduce traffic congestion, motivate students to get to class, meet new friends, and not be broke after paying for parking. Free parking is good for the students and good for the school. Okay, come on down ladies. We got a lot of uh, fun people here on campus, I love it. Kim, we'll take the mic. Thanks. Well, as you can see, this is a great idea. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of fun doing it and we got closer as, you know, I got to get to know um, people from the community or from the school. So yeah, we had a great time. And um, obviously, um, I think the, the fact that getting to know more people, it's something that a community college has a problem with that uh, maybe a four-year university where people are actually staying on campus um, doesn't have quite as many problems. Well, good evening and enjoyed the presentation. You have coffee. Uh, Deb is up at nine o'clock, and yeah. it's uh, yeah. good to know you can get in on time. Yeah. <laughs> a quick question for you: Have you pursued or thought about uh, one of the ideas you mentioned, just a separate lot or a, se a couple separate uh, levels for carpoolers? Have you d uh, done any research into that? Yeah, um, my original idea was to have to offer it to three or more people to like increase that incentive um, to get more people into the, into um, one car. 
So it would take more cars out of that. But yeah, preferential parking is um, key here. I think, um, you know, sometimes we have our favorite lots and there are better lots than other times. So yeah, having preferential lots is a definite plus. I very much like that idea, um, and and I'm thinking about our our high, what's our higher price version already that guarantees a spot that we do through Student Congress um, to do something similar to that. So um, it's kind of a general question because there has been a theme, but I I understand we did the Blackboard survey and I'm very impressed with the results. But even Lisa, from faculty perspective or Deb from employees. Um, do we do we have a cultural issue around willingness to carpool that still needs to be overcome? And in any of the uh, presentations or thoughts or, or research, did you encounter the, a resistance to carpooling at all? Well, the one thing I found interesting is we already have a relationship with the Rapid, and we already have this ride share on our website, but I had never heard of it before. So I think there's a lack of communication out there and that we need to really present this as something we're promoting and a change in culture, and the fact that if people don't know about it, they're not going to use it, I think is a big deal. So I don't know if it's necessarily an opposition or if maybe we just haven't spread the word enough. To answer your question, Vicki, it's <laughs> through um, Student Life, and it's um, the College Park and Ride yep. um, in the College Avenue Park. Um, my question was, how would you guys get the park and or ride and share? How would you guys market that, get um, the name out there to the students so that they know about mm -hmm. park and ride? There's already established in place um, different marketing tools. Salt Street Journal is definitely a one, one of those that um, gets the word out. Notice um, some of those um, student activities that get advertised through there get used. You go to those activities and they're crowded. So obviously the Salt Street Journal was a good idea. It gets the word across. So that's um, one of the main ones. Otherwise the paper. <laughs> But just things that are already established so we don't have additional costs for the school. We were also thinking of involving that in the new student orientation since that's evolving all the time. And also, I think if you let faculty know and you let staff know, they can help spread the word to the students. Thanks. Nice job, ladies. Thank you. Okay. Okay, one last round of applause for all of our eight teams. Okay, so what's going to happen now, now the tough work, because there are some themes and there's a lot of nuances between the different programs. So the judging, I think, are, I have a tough decision in front of them. We're going to take a 20-minute break. The judges are going to deliberate. For anybody who wasn't directly part of the contest uh, or competition this year, it's also important for you to know that all of the teams had to submit written documentation and reports in advance. So they had that time to review that written information in the plans before the presentation tonight. So uh, they're going to add in what they've already documented on your written reports in addition to the video and the Q&A that they learned tonight. We've got 20 minutes for them to deliberate. Uh, there are refreshments up here. Please come down and help yourself to some of those. They'll be back and we will uh, pass out some cash, okay? Thanks so much. Yes? Okay. So it's 8 o'clock, the moment we've all been waiting for. Uh, time for awards and cash and all uh, things that are happy. Um, Moss Ingram is going to explain a little bit about the judges' deliberations, um, and then we're going to invite our folks up to present the awards. So the judges have completed their deliberations, and this was very, very very difficult. Obviously, there were some key... <laughs> Thank you again to our judges. There were some uh, key themes, some overlapping themes. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, uh, certainly some key differences. 
And one of the, the, um, the things that the uh, judges wanted to make sure that they imparted was that uh, what we would like to do as a college, regardless of uh, who wins tonight, that the best components of all of the ideas will uh, be used together to create the best solution. And clearly, uh, that is what uh, the judges would like to see happen, is that pieces of all of the ideas, yes. Because there were amazing components uh, of, of all of the ideas. So um, without further ado, we will begin uh, the awards. So Dr. Ender and Armin, please come on down. Armin, if you would be so kind as to uh, disperse the checks. Hang tight. <laughs> so third place goes to Cadis Mercer Curtis and team. Cadence and team, come on down. Congratulations. Third place, $750. Wonderful. This is exciting. Second place, Nathaniel Shapiro and team. Congratulations. Come on down. And the big award, $3,000, goes to Pam Scott and team. Congratulations. Okay, well, again, thanks to everybody for competing, for giving of your time and your talent and your insight to help make GRCC a more innovative culture. Uh, I know that a combination of a lot of these ideas are going to make a great impact here on campus, um, not only for our college, our students, our staff, our faculty, but for our greater community. So thank you for what you've contributed, and uh, hope to see you in next year's competition. Have a good night. Thank you.